please stand for the prayer as we start the meeting. Dear God, today as we this session opens, we pray for your presence will be before us and everyone who serves in the decision-making process of our city. We pray for the direction which will lead our city to be strong and unified. May we continue the legacy of our founders. May we be granted this day of wisdom to make decisions which will be good for our city. We also pray for your special blessing on all those who are working to transform our city and make it a better place to live and work. Amen. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Neely. Here. Council Mercy. Here. Here. Council Noon. Council Rourke. Here. Council Samaras. Here. Council Chow. Here. Council Conway. Here. Council Drinkwater. Here. Council Elliott. Seven present. Thank you. Any memorials, Council of Samaras? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to dock in the chambers for Jody T. O'Hearn. Jody T. Jo Joanna T. Jody Tiger O'Hearn, 70, a resident of the Belvedere section of Lowell, passed away peacefully at her home on Monday, December 6, 2021, surrounded by her loving family. She was the beloved wife for over 40 years, 49 years, to Peter T. O'Hearn, who survives her. Born in Lowell, Massachusetts, May 20th, 1951, the daughter of the late Dr. Thomas J.G. Tai and the late Barbara Buckland Tai. She was a graduate of the former Roger Hall in Lowell, class of 1969. Jody went on to graduate in 1973 from Lowell State Teachers College with a Bachelor of Arts in Education. Later, she received her Master's in Education from Cambridge College. Prior to her retirement after a long and dedicated career in public education, Jody was the library media specialist at Lowell High School and later at the Tenney School in the Methuen School System. She began her career as an x-ray technician at St. John's Hospital in Lowell. Among her many interests, Jody was an accomplished skier and shared her love of skiing by serving as the varsity ski coach at Lowell High School for several years and as a 25-year member of the National Ski Patrol in Quichy, Vermont. In addition, she was a professional riding instructor and exhibitor of horses at the Whippoorwill Farm in North Andover. However, Jody's greatest love was her family, especially her children and grandchildren. She, with her husband Peter, chose interests and activities that were family-oriented. Over the years, they created many great family memories at their home in Quichy, Vermont. Beside her husband, Jody is survived by four sons, Sean O'Hearn and his wife, Christy Langone of Wilmington, Mass., James O'Hearn and his wife, Amanda of Lowell, Mass., Patrick O'Hearn and his wife, Erin of Charlestown, Mass., Thomas O'Hearn of Lowell, Mass., two daughters, Malika O'Hearn of Lowell and Lena O'Hearn and her partner, John Londono of Woburn, seven grandchildren, Jack and Nora O'Hearn of Wilmington, Madison and Peyton O'Hearn of Lowell, Brendan and Colleen O'Hearn of Charlestown, and Mason Lodano of Woburn, her brother Thomas Ty and his wife Lina of Townsend, Maryland, her brother-in-law John O'Hearn and his wife Veronica of Knoxville, Tennessee, a sister-in-law Marion O'Hearn of Lowell, Mass., and many nieces and nephews. I also have to add, as headmaster of Lowell High School, and Mr. Conway as housemaster, we had the privilege of working with Ms. O'Hearn. Uh, she, she was a librarian at Lowell High School and she worked with Kathy McDonald. And you could not have two better caring and hardworking people than Kathy and Jody. I think Ms. McDonald will tell you how hard Jody worked for each and every student. I can remember when she came to my office and said, we need a ski team. I said, okay, end of the week we had a ski team. When it came to staff, she opened her home to the entire school staff. Lowell High School had a staff 
almost 300 people, in which parties were given to develop collaboration and support of each other to better work with the students. All I have to say is Ms. O'Hearn, or Mrs. O'Hearn, was a wonderful parent, a wonderful teacher, a wonderful person, and she'll be sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else tonight? Or if we can dock at the chambers. Uh, next on the mayor's business, uh, communication, remote, and Zoom participation. Need a motion to accept and place on file by Councilor Chow, seconded by Councilor Drinkwater. Uh, next, we have recognition of the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gloves in Lowell. Uh, tonight, we have uh, uh, the privilege of having a few gentlemen here, and I'll let Mr. Kevin Coughlin come up, who is the um, president now of the Sun Charities, to do the introduction. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, uh, Madam Manager, thank you very much for allowing us to come before you tonight uh, to bring uh, the good news uh, story of the Golden Gloves returning to Lowell uh, to perform again in their uh, exercises and in their athletic event in the year 2022, beginning on January 13th. I feel like I'm in the footsteps of Terry McCarthy tonight, a uh, wonderful and respected public official who had so many meetings in this room. And I want to just acknowledge him that we walk in the footsteps of his work as we bring the Golden Gloves uh, back uh, to the city of Lowell. In addition to the fact that uh, it's returning after a year hiatus due to COVID, uh, it is also the 75th anniversary that we're celebrating this year. And this has really been such a tradition in Lowell in so many ways. First and foremost, the impact on the, the youth development and the growth for so many values and generations of people here in Lowell. For the recreational point of view, bringing the sport into the city all of those times. For the vitality of a gateway city like Lowell in order to continue the traditions and have such uh, values and uh, such a sport in place for 75 years. And also, not least, is the revenue that it brings from the individuals who come to see the sport and to enjoy the downtown. I really want to thank and go back all those years to thank all the individuals who participated in the great Golden Gloves traditions, from the people who took tickets, sold tickets, worked, enjoyed, volunteered, came for, to be a spectator, and of course, those who performed and those who supported the performers with all the uh, training facilities that were in the city in many different neighborhoods. We look forward to a successful and safe season this year, and uh, we look forward to many successful years continuing this tradition in the city of Lowell. I'd like to bring to the microphone right now uh, Bob Russo, he is the executive director of the New England Golden Gloves, and he is the facilitator for this program. Bob? Thank you, Mayor and, and Council Members, giving us a few moments to just basically brag about the Golden Gloves and all the good works of the charities. The Golden Glove Tournament in this city serves so many great great purposes, <clears throat> not just nine nights of good boxing entertainment. It's a program for at-risk kids, those critical teenage heirs, when they're seeking identity, <clears throat> direction in this sport, and these boxing programs provide direction, discipline, drug and alcohol-free athletic lifestyle to the youth who might otherwise be getting in trouble instead of being in a gym and gaining self-confidence and self-esteem. It's also obviously a great local tradition that has great impact on the city. In the dead of winter, when certainly 
helps the local economy with thousands of boxing fans come into town. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, last but certainly not least, over the past 75 years, the Lowell Sun Charities has raised millions of dollars. All profits of the Golden Gloves go to benefit countless charities right here in the greater Lowell area, including donations to soup kitchens, veterans programs, boys and girls clubs, cancer research, and helping the homeless. I'm very proud to be part of this organization. So whatever you guys can do to help us promote and spread the word, that would be muchly appreciated. Thank you for your time, and uh, happy holidays to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well stated. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, invite Peter Lally, the president of the Lowell Management Group, and his general manager, Brandon Karen, to come to the microphone. Thank you all. It's good to see everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the council and uh, the manager and her administration for uh, all the support that you've given the auditorium over these last couple of uh, challenging times that we've been through. We are coming back, though. It, uh, it, the great traditions that we have at the auditorium are, are starting to uh, come back again. We've got the Boston Pops coming on Sunday. Uh, we have Broadway starting back up again in January. And we have what I think is the greatest sports tradition in New England coming back after a year hiatus with the Golden Gloves. Uh, it's really exciting to see uh, these events coming back. Uh, remember, spread the word. Thursday night is fight night again. We're right back in the groove on Thursday nights. Uh, over the couple of years prior to, uh, unfortunately, having to not do the gloves last year, we saw a great rebound in the attendance at the gloves. So uh, that was really exciting momentum. And uh, I've been in some way or a part of the first Golden Gloves uh, when I first started at the auditorium in 1999 was uh, a... a um, uh, you've noticed, I've noticed over the years how cyclical it can be, it can, you know, the, the sport kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, and it was really on a great upswing uh, as we ran into 2018 and 19, and uh, in 2020, one of the very last events that we had uh, before we had to shut down uh, was the finals of the Golden Gloves, and it was just an electric night, it was, uh, I don't think we had had as many people that evening um, for a Golden Gloves boxing in probably eight or nine years maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, so we were on a roll with it, and, and Bob, and uh, it, of course, we mentioned uh, Terry McCarthy, who's, who's dearly missed, and, and so excited to have Kevin as part of it. Um, things were really moving, and we're hoping to get that momentum back, uh, and uh, we have a great 75th anniversary of, uh, of the Golden Gloves as we move into 2022. Um, and Brandon and I and, and the rest of the team at the auditorium are, are very excited to get that going along with uh, uh, Kevin and Bob and their team. So. Um, but again, thank you all so much for all the support you've given us. We're uh, great to see this momentum coming back to the auditorium. We're excited for a, a strong 2022, and this will be a, a great way to kick it off on January 13th. If I got that, all right, good, remembered. Uh, January 13th is the opening night, so come on down. And uh, if you can't make it the 13th, you've got eight more chances every Thursday thereafter. Thank you very much, and again, happy holidays. Thank you. We provided a brief information booklet for each of the counselors and uh, the manager and the staff. And uh, I didn't want to leave the microphone without just mentioning some of the great names that have performed in the Golden Gloves in the past. Some of the world champions that have been here for New England Golden Gloves are Mike Tyson, Rocky Marciano, John Ruiz, Marvin Hagler, Vinny Pizienza, Joey Gamache, and of course, Lowell's own Mickey Ward. Thank you very much. We'll see you with the Golden Gloves on the 13th. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Quick question. Yeah, I'm seeing the carrier or to Peter. Did they still have the season pass available? Yes, thank you, Councilor, for, uh, I should have brought that up. Uh, season passes, if you want to go all nine nights, are on sale. You can buy uh, season tickets, uh, and also all the tickets for the individual uh, bouts uh, each night are on sale now. So lowlauditorium.com, and uh, come down and see us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Chow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, Golden Gloves for these little gloves here. 
I think uh, my, my uh, fist might be able to fit them. It's, it's small enough. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin, uh, Mr. Russo, and Pete for coming in to talk uh, about the Golden Gloves. Um, what I heard from everybody, this is really a, a great tradition. And I, I've been to uh, um, a couple of events uh, in the past years. It's very, very exciting to see those young boxers. They, they fight to bring a lot of tradition, a lot of excitement uh, to Lowell. And, you know, we, we missed one event last, last year. So hopefully um, the, the public, the citizens of Lowell, will go out this year to support uh, th this event. Um, you mentioned earlier that you need support from, from the city. What, what kind of support can the, the council or the residents uh, provide uh, to the event? either Kevin or Pete Lally. Well, of course, uh, we already have a lot of good things happening at the auditorium, and Peter can address those. But I think uh, any uh, advanced word, promotion, uh, anything that uh, augments the activities going down there that with which we could dovetail, anything that we could combine with promotions that are already going on in the city in order to pass the word would be good. Yeah, just to, to echo what Kevin said, um, one of the things that's uh, a, uh, a challenge in, in some respects is just getting the momentum going back again and, and reminding everybody that we are open and we're doing events, and um, uh, especially after the holidays, this starts on January 13th, so uh, we've got to remind people right away after the holidays that we're, we're up and running quickly, so um, that's definitely something that uh, is a great help to just to help spread the word that uh, we're back and starting up again. Thank you so much again, and definitely um, I'll be at the opening night. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Rock. Yeah, thank you to answer uh, Councilor Charles' question. Maybe Councilor Charles can sign up with the Novice Division and fight another city council for something. All right. <laughs> Give All right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Coughlin and company. Um, next, uh, Madam Manager, did you want to do introduction to the new department heads? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for taking it out of order. We have four new department heads here, and um, I, I know uh, there was a request last week to bring in uh, two of them, and now there's two more, so we're bringing them all in tonight. Um, first, in the order of their uh, starting here with the city, let me introduce Lisa Golden, the new director of the Health and Human Services. Lisa Golden started at, as HHS director in November. Most recently, she worked as an administrator coordinator at Lowell General Hospital, overseeing the hospital's entire nursing staff during the off shift. She worked in the health department previously for many years as a school nurse and a nurse manager. Lisa is a Lowell resident, and we're delighted to have her here as our new director of HHS. Thank you, Mayor, Manager. City Council. So I think I was before this council a couple of years ago when I was um, appointed to the Board of Health. Um, it's interesting on my long ride from Merrimack Street to here, I was, I was thinking when I was going to introduce myself, I'm like, so I've been here for five weeks. Seems like about five months. Um, <laughs> it has been a long five weeks. Um, I think in front of you, you actually have a memorandum that um, the manager and I um, put together for you with um, an update on COVID. Um, she gave me a nice introduction. Um, I'm a 30 year nurse, um, raised in the city. My children have gone through the Lowell Public Schools and this is where I've worked for the longest time. I feel like I have an attraction to the health department because I was a school nurse. I worked as a nurse leader and then on the board of health. So there wasn't much introduction that I needed and I've jumped right in. and both feet running. Um, the health department has um, taken up a lot of my time with health and human services with um, COVID, but I've given the other departments um, recreation, library, senior center, and veterans some time as well. So I have given some time to everybody, but I just, I know that um, a lot of you have received phone calls related to the Board of Health emergency meeting last night with the mask mandate, and I know that's on a lot of people's agenda. So I just wanted to give you an update with COVID in the city and also the mask mandate and where that was coming from. So you can see on the top of the paper, the grid where Lowell sits, um, our positivity rate is 9.87. And I know a lot of people are probably burnt out with COVID. We're going into year two. 
no one is more burnt out than the nursing staff in the hospital, um, the staff in the health department, and I will go through all of the measures that we have taken, and it feels like we are just swimming upstream and we're really not getting anywhere. The state average right now is 5.1, so Lowell is double that. Um, just so you know where that number is coming from, we average about 100 new cases of COVID a day. So that's where that number is coming from. Um, so that means that we have a daily incident rate of about 76.1. So our two-week case total, like I said, is about 100 a day. So that's 1,237 cases in the two-week period. Um, so a lot of our cases are under 19, so zero to 19, and you will, I'm sure you guys heard a lot about the test and stay program in the school. We're testing a lot of kids. Two weeks ago, the National Guard came in so that we could enhance that program and get more kids tested. So basically what we're trying to do is test the children so that the asymptomatic kids are tested and they stay in school so that we do not have to close anything down and that the kids can stay in the schools and the schools can stay open. So that's where that program is. Um, and that's why we're trying to get the National Guard in there to get that done. So it's not the elderly, um, even though the elderly are the ones who are getting sicker and the ones who are not doing as well when they are sick. Um, so yesterday the um, Board of Health voted on the indoor mask mandate. When you look on the first page, other cities have indoor mask mandates. Boston has an indoor mask mandate, and you see that their positivity rate is 1.93. And also um, Worcester has an indoor mask ma mandate, and their positivity rate is 2.78. So we really can't compare ourselves to places like Westford that has an indoor mask mandate because we're just not comparable to those cities. I know that I've gotten a lot of calls today and people are asking why the governor didn't do a full statewide indoor mask mandate. And the reason behind that is there are towns out there like Bedford that have an 80% vaccination rate and we just don't have that in Lowell. Um, and I'll get down to that. Um, so the CDC does recommend in towns that have a high rate of COVID that we do enforce an indoor mask mandate. At least it's something that we can do to try to cut down the spread of COVID. The Board of Health did listen yesterday to probably about 10 or 12 local business owners who did come forward and speak at the open meeting and they were sympathetic to them. They are concerned. They are concerned about who will be enforcing it. And Sean Machado from the inspector's office was there and he will be out putting out the signs and working with business owners. The next Board of Health meeting is on January 5th and they will invite the public to speak at that. They're looking at the numbers, and as soon as the numbers start to drop, they will drop the indoor mask mandate, and it is temporary until February 2nd is the date that's on it as of right now. As for vaccination efforts, um, we have done so many things that we possibly can. Um, we have a site at Old Ferry Road that's open five days a week. Cataldo Ambulance is doing vaccinations. <laughs> They're open eight to 12 hours a day giving vaccinations. It's not all Lowell residents that are there, but 31% of their vaccines that they're giving are to Lowell residents. Um, they're also going to the schools. They're doing mobile clinics in the schools. They've come to City Hall to do two clinics. They've looked at Centerville because Centerville is an area, the state has a vaccine equity group and Centerville is an area that people are not coming out to give vaccines. They've gone to the schools there, they've gone to the church groups, they've gone to the neighborhood groups. They'll basically go anywhere, any day of the week. They've gone Saturdays, they've gone Sundays, they've gone midday, they've gone late in the day. Um, there's so many groups trying to figure out where to go, when to go, any ideas. And we have actually gotten up to a rate of Fully vaccinated right now in the city of Lowell is, and the state's actually pretty happy with us. Fully vaccinated, we have a rate of 65.8. So we're actually doing pretty good. And that also includes, they just opened recently to the age of five to 11. 
So a lot of those kids were only eligible for their second vaccine right around Thanksgiving. So some of those schools, like tomorrow, the Shaughnessy School has their second clinic. So some of those kids will just be getting their second vaccine tomorrow. So some of those kids are right in the window to get their second vaccine. So those will pick us up a little bit. But we're really at a snail's pace of picking up those, those rates. But we are going up. It's just a little bit at a time. The health department is also giving out vaccine. I just um, was there drawing up vaccines. We give out all three, J&J, &J, Moderna, and Pfizer. Um, so we're drawing them up. We just gave out, I think, I think today was 52 vaccines. Also at the same time, we have flu going on. So we're giving out flu vaccines at the same time. So we have all of that going on. Um, and then we're also doing testing. So that's also a big thing. We have testing going on. Kali is open seven days a week. Um, so they're doing testing, um, stop the spread. The state is doing that testing um, and anybody in the state can go through there. So they're doing that seven days a week and they've increased their times of testing. Um, and that they have increased their, um, the grant the state did and they'll increase that through March. So they'll be staying there till March and that has been um, secured. Um, the city employees, any city employee who um, contracts, contacts COVID or is in contact with someone with COVID outside of the workplace is going through myself and then I'm doing the contact tracing and then also a city employee who's in contact with another employee who has COVID I deal with and then I get them to be tested through Trinity. Um, and then in the schools, all the kids are being tested as well. And then I think if there's something else. Yesterday we found out, I don't know if anybody read in the paper or on the news, we're one of 102 towns that are getting free tests through the state. So we're getting, get the number right, 70, 72,000 tests, um, free tests to the, delivered to the state that we can give out hopefully to needy families. Um, and we're just in the planning. We had a meeting yesterday and then we had a meeting today. We have to figure out how to store all of this and then how to get it out hopefully prior to the holidays um, to get it out. And then there's gonna be an option to be able to get more free tests available. And Lowell was actually, we didn't have to apply for it or anything. They just gave it to us and we're one of those that are able to get that out as well. And then along with that is contact tracing that we're doing as well. So anybody who has, has COVID, the health department does contact tracing. So we have to contact that person and find out who they've been in contact with during their infectious period. It's exhausting. Um, so that's all in here, hopefully, so that you guys can all understand what we're doing. And all of this is to try to stop the spread. At the same time, we also deal with the hospital. So just to backtrack just a little bit from where this is all coming from, in September and October, the hospital only had 20 COVID patients. Monday, they had 60 COVID patients. So they ha usually have two ICUs, they have 23 beds. Last week, they maxed their 23 beds and they opened up a third ICU. So there was a day last week that the only, and every day the hospital, since COVID started 15, 18 months ago, they have a call, a conference call through the state. And last week, the only bed that they could find for an ICU patient in the whole region was in Virginia. So someone had to be airlifted to Virginia. That meant that every hospital bed in Boston that had an ICU bed was full. Wow. So it was a very scary situation if anybody gets sick. And that is the reason for the mask mandate, that if someone is ill and goes to the hospital, there is such a crunch that there is no place for them to go to. And two thirds of the, pop, of, the host, of the hospitalized patients are not vaccinated. I'll stop, sorry. So, no, thank you, Madam I think Madam. we have, do you want the public hearing, Mr. Mayor, or do you want me to continue? We can just finish up quickly, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank yeah, you, Lisa. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, the next uh, department head who was hired, um, the city treasurer, Theodoros Panagiotopoulos. Um, he started as treasurer on December 6th. He has more than 20 years experience in the private sector in finance and accounting. 
and most recently he worked as a business controller for Inject Aero LLC, an aerospace company with offices in Malden. And Theodoros, um, Ted, is also a Lowell resident, so welcome. Yes, uh, Mayor, City Manager, Council, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, serve the city of Lowell, city of level. Welcome my parents as immigrants from Greece, and I was able to raise my children here as well, and I look forward to serving my home, my city. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next department head, um, Peter Crew, has started as the Director of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, CASE. Um, Peter joined the Office of CASE uh, on December 6th as well. He brings nearly 13 years experience in Lowell's arts and culture sector. Uh, and he spent over a decade working at Lowell's Merrimack Repertory Theater. And Peter Crew is also a Lowell resident. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam uh, Manager. Uh, again, I'm delighted to be serving the city in this new capacity and bringing my experience in Lowell's arts and culture uh, to CASE. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And next, uh, a new position, first uh, ever. Um, uh, I want to introduce to you Ferdusi Farouk as our Chief DEI Officer. Ferdusi started yesterday, and she is the city's first DEI Officer following the city's creation of the position earlier this year. Ferdusi holds certificates from Cornell University in Diversity and Inclusion, Leadership and Employment Law. She has 15 years professional experience in the financial sector and most recently served as Director of Social Development at the Shriver Job Corps Center. So welcome, Ferdusi. Thank you. You can't see, but behind my mask is a big smile. I'm so happy to be here, um, and I'm really excited to spearhead the city's initiatives on DEI. Thank you. Thank you. Did we hire anybody else? Not, no, that, that's about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. And welcome to everybody, thank you. Um, being seven o'clock, did you wanna say something, Council Murray? Um, if, if you wanna to go to the uh, uh, public hearings at seven o'clock, that's fine, but after we get out of that, could we then uh, take out of suspension of the rules my motion of 10 for, uh, to, uh, we have a speaker here and I don't want to keep people here all night. Thank you. Okay. Sure, 10 to, yeah. Okay, being seven, after seven o'clock, we're gonna to go to the general public hearing, 5-1. Uh, this is a vote for the minimum residential factor, FY 2022, and that rate is, to give the rate of, Point, point eight eight two zero five four. Um, does anybody have any questions on that, Madam Manager? Did you want to? What? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so we'll do open. Hold it open to anybody in in favor. In favor. Anyone here to speak in favor? In favor, hearing none. That portion is closed. Anybody wanting to speak in opposition? Opposition? Opposition, that portion is closed. Um, All right, so just need a motion to adopt if there's any questions. So moved. No, motion by Council Samara, second by Council Rourke. Uh, roll call. Bailey. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. Council Noon. Council Rourke. Yes. Council Samaras. Yes. Council Chow. Yes. Council Conway. Yes. Council Drinkwater. Yes. Council Elliott. Seven yeas. Okay, motion to. Um, Take a uh, go out of sequence by Council Mercy, a second by Council 
Chow. Uh, take 10-2 up. Motions. 10-4. Uh, What's I that? 10-4. Uh, I got 10-2, but. Oh, is it 10-2? Oh, it's, it's hard for me. Right. Sure. <coughs> so, count, motion by Councilor Mercy here requests City Manager find ways and means to implement the language line uh, in the LPD and City Hall. Seconded by Councilor Drinkwater, Councilor Mercia. You want the speaker to go yes, first? Yes, let okay. the speaker go first. All right, we have registered speaker for 10 2. Yes, um, Yan Ju Choi. Good evening, Mayor Leahy, uh, City Councilors, and Madam Manager. My name is Yun Ju Che, and I'm the Executive Director of Coalition for a Better Acre. Today, I'm here to support Councilor Mercier's motion for Lowell Police Department and the City Hall to implement the language line. As a first-generation immigrant who came to this country without speaking any language, English, I know firsthand how difficult it is to maneuver when you have language barrier. We often hear people say, if you live in this country, you should learn to speak the um, language. Learning a new language for adults who are also working hard to make ends meet and support their family, learning their language isn't always their priority. At least it wasn't for my mother. She and my father, however, without becoming profession in English, sent all of their four children to college, and when they retired, their house was fully paid for, and had some savings to live comfortably, comfortable life after their retirement. Just about a year after coming to this country, my mother was diagnosed with cervical cancer, and she spent 28 days at the Tufts Medical Center. After being discharged from the hospital, she spent another three months getting radiation and other treatments in Boston area, away from home in, home in Maine. When she was going through this, Without interpretation services, I'm not sure how my mother would have received services she needed. My, my mother learned to speak very basic language, but as we all know, trying to understand medical language is on a um, different level. My family and I are forever grateful to the health care and interpretation service my mother received. Without it, she may not be here with us 40 years later. Language, no, language line is widely used, especially in the areas with diverse population. I know Lowell General Hospital, Lowell Community Health Center, and several Lowell nonprofits currently utilize language lines. Lowell Public School uses Lion Bridge, which is similar translation services. It's a great way to provide language access at very nominal cost. As an advocate for language access, I'm very happy to see that this motion is on the deck today. At a city that speaks 70 plus uh, different languages, it's hard to believe we don't already have an access to a language line. By implementing language line at the police department and the city hall, more of our diverse residents will be able to access services to pay their taxes, get copies of social security card, get married, get permits to renovate their houses, report theft, and all the important services the city provides. Finally, I would like to give you a couple actual examples why the language line is so needed in this city. Several years ago, I was at the city hall when an elderly woman waved for me to come over. She started speaking Khmer to me. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Korean and I don't speak Khmer. I made a motion for her to hold and I called my Khmer staff at CBA. After speaking to her, he asked me to bring her back to CBA's office, and later he brought her back to get the service she needed. And more serious concern happened for me a couple months ago. I was doing an exit interview with one of our resident service coordinator for our properties, and she mentioned one of our residents had to go to police station, and she was turned away because police department didn't have anyone who spoke Spanish at that time. Our resident went directly to our resident service coordinator for help, and our resident service coordinator was able to provide translation. Spanish and Khmer are two most spoken English in the city of Lowell. If they can't get services uh, and uh, what they need, what's happening to people who speak much more difficult language to get translated? 
For these reasons, it's critical that our city provide access to a language line to our residents. Again, I would like to thank Councillor Mercier for bringing this important motion and happy holidays. Thank you. Councillor Mercier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's not much more to say, but I will try. When it comes to the Lowell Police Department, I have the greatest respect for them. And this motion aims at providing all the tools necessary to deliver the best level of trust and concern possible for them. The reason I am proceeding these words this way is that not too long ago, a woman went to the police department on Ann Arcan Drive in need of their help. The major issue was that the woman could not speak English and no translator was available. Therefore, the resident got no help and more or less was turned away. Not the police department's fault, no better than anyone coming to me looking for help, unable to speak English. But let's think about this situation a little bit more. What if this woman's problem was domestic violence at home? With lack of communication and no help and no choice but to return home, things could have gotten a lot worse. This motion before us could save a life. This motion could create a bridge that would fill the gap of despair and turn it into trust. This motion is asking the city to look into purchasing the language line, Globo or Lion Bridge out of Waltham, Mass, or even using an application to our phone system to provide this valuable service of translation in different languages. Language Line can access translators up to 250 languages 24-7 in less than 30 seconds with every, when every second counts. This is a city of diversity and not everyone speaks English. The face of our city is changing and we must change with it. The greatest reward comes from seeing people smile when they are understood and getting the help that they properly need. This is the experience for which we live. This system could generate trust. I am understanding that the service is not that expensive, even if used once and it saves one life, it's worth it. The cost would be worth it. Having this service in the city hall would also be beneficial. I don't care how we get there. I'm just asking for a means of communicating with the third entity that knows that particular language instead of being turned away. I would ask that this motion be referred to the city manager as well as Maran Fernandez. Thank you, I think it's that important. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Very important issue. Any other discussion? Councilor Chow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, the, the make of the motion and the Richard speaker uh, described the situation very well. Just a quick things to add, um, we have just at the Lowell High School, this is how our base, how many languages, how many ethnicities we have in the city. There's between 60 and 70 different languages spoken at Lowell High School. And that just show how many languages are there, uh, many different uh, citizens are there in our city that could use a language um, translation services. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to the agenda. Um, huh? yeah. uh, city clerk portion 3.1 minutes of the city council meeting December 7th for acceptance. Need a motion to accept and place on file by Councilor Conway, seconded by Councilor Drinkwater. Four unfinished business. For one ordinance to amend section nine floodplain overlay. Need a motion to refer to the planning board for a report and recommendation and a public hearing set on January 11th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Motion, any speaking on that or no? Motion by Council Rourke, seconded by Council Samaras. Communications, city manager. Um, motion response A. Uh, election assignment. Councilor Noon's not here, but any questions on that report? 
Any questions on, uh, we have a registered speaker for motion, for response B, HDIP? Yeah, let me let, it, I gotta get a mention. Okay. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Uh, Jeffrey Bush. Got to unmute. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, and Madam City Manager. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the uh, proposed change to the TIE program through the uh, Housing Development Incentive Program that's administered by the state and city. Uh, I represent, uh, I'm a president of Heritage Properties. I'm residential management company that's been here in Lowell for over 40 years. Uh, and we've done developments uh, as recently as 2020 in the city. Our most recent development was of the mill building located at 850 Lawrence Street, which is now referred to as Waterhead. Uh, it's 71 apartments, 67 one bedrooms and four studio apartments. Um, we got involved with the project back in 2017 and started speaking with the city about developing what was at the time a blighted project into market rate housing. Uh, the city encouraged us to look into this HDIP program, which we were at the time unaware of, uh, that became a key component of our success in the project. Uh, in order to get the project financed and completed, we uh, utilized a number of different state and local and federal uh, tax credits, including the state and federal historic tax credits and the HDIP tax credits uh, through the state, as well as the tie agreement that's administered by the city. We received the full $2 million in tax credits from the state for this project. And without that tax money, the, um, the project would have been unfeasible. There were a number of construction costs and overages that were related to the historic nature of the building. Uh, that couldn't have been overcome without the funding from the state. The tie agreement that we got from the city at the time was also incredibly helpful uh, in terms of bringing kind of stabilized operations to the property. And so when I was reached out to by uh, various members of the city regarding the change that the state is, has elected to make in terms of reducing the number of tax dollars available to this project at the state level uh, and the city of Wool's response to try and increase the tax exempt, uh, uh, tax increment exemption that they offer. I was really excited to hear that because I think it's a crucial component of trying to keep market rate housing developments alive in a city that uh, has really benefited from that development recently. Um, as a, by, by way of example, this project that we worked on was completed in um, April of 2020 and is currently 100% lease. We have 71 apartments, we have 71 full apartments. So there's there's a lot of demand for this type of product here. We think um, it's, a, it's a great program that the state has administered. It's unfortunate that they've decided to make the changes that they have, but we really appreciate the city trying to step up and fill that gap. So any questions I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? No. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions on the motion? Any questions on uh, motion response C, vandalism in the back central? Council Mercia? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. On that particular motion and referred to the city manager, it wasn't left undone. Since November 10th, they have been very busy there. The police. 99 direct patrols took place there, 106 field interviews, affected 20 arrests, um, and the co-response clinician was there as well. It seemed like they utilized everybody they could to make a difference and an impact in that neighborhood. I'm very grateful that they did that. I have gone by on a few occasions just to see uh, when it was dark and late at night less and less people were hanging around there. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Madam Manager. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on the last report? Uh, grants for the video cameras? Informational, Madam Manager, refunding in the budget savings? 
Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. And so on, on this informational, it's, it's uh, Mr. Baldwin put together a report regarding the savings with regard to the refinancing of bonds, if Mr. Baldwin could address that. Thank you, Madam Manager. This is just a, an update for the council on a, a recent sale of refunding bonds. It's good news. We were able to, due to the market conditions for municipal bonds right now, uh, refund an outstanding issue related to some qualified energy conservation bonds that were sold uh, several years ago to generate a total of $400,000 in, in savings over the life of the debt service. Outstanding. Um, what's most notable about the saving is just under $200,000 of that will come in FY 2022, the current fiscal year. Um, so we're we're very happy about those results. It'll it'll help ease some of the constraints on the FY 22 budget. Um, we had another successful refunding earlier this year, and together those two uh, issuances provided a total of $800,000 in savings um, over the life of the two bonds outstanding. Uh, included in the packet is a copy of the most recent credit report for the, the uh, city of Lowell. Um, and, and we maintain that um, we have a good credit rating according to Standard & Poor's. They made note of the city's strong liquidity, a very strong fiscal management, uh, and a copy of that is there for the city council and for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Okay. Need a motion to accept and place on file the reports by Councilor Rook, second by Councilor Mercia. M Mr. Councilor Mayor, Mercia. Yeah. I, I, if I have a trouble look on my face, I do because it, the, the uh, motion D about grants for video cameras, I do have some concern about that. And it seems like there's no law enforcement grants available for the particular videos. And I, and I understand that and I'm not surprised to hear that. But what I am surprised to hear is, let's say that I own a business and I have a, a camera outside of my business and I, I don't know if, if, I, if there's a problem with anybody wanting to register that with the police department so that if anything happens within that neighborhood and they wanna come to me and use my video to see what they could capture, Businesses, am I reading this right, that businesses is afraid to get involved with that? I, I don't understand that because it, one hand works together with the other and I don't understand. If I owned a business, I'd be happy to have the police come to me and say, can we see a camera? It's an effort to make this a better city with people realizing Oh my God, I can't rob over there. They, they, they get cameras all over. This seems to be the way of the future where you, you know, you're afraid to cause any commotion or trouble or stealing or whatever for fear that that camera's gonna be on and you're gonna get caught. If you have nothing to hide or you're not doing anything wrong, what do you care if there's cameras all over? Uh, but I don't know what, I don't understand why businesses don't want to get involved with sharing that. Uh, what is the problem with that? Who knows Madam the Manager. answer? Yeah, Thank that, you. Thank you. And, and I agree, it would, it would seem to be much more beneficial to the business owner, to the neighborhood, and so forth. I think what the report uh, describes is the experience that they've had in trying to see if people want to sign up with a registry with the police that they have cameras so that the police have an easy go-to if, if an incident were to happen. The experience that they had is that people were reluctant, partly because they don't want to get involved in having their records subpoenaed for court or things of that nature. It, 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 I don't think it's so much that they don't want to participate, but they don't want to formally agree to be on a record or on a registry. So, you know, this, I, I think the um, concerns um, in terms of the registry isn't so much from not wanting to be cooperative, um, but they're leery of what that may mean for them down the road. What we're, we're gonna continue to work, you know, around this issue as was pointed out, you know, there is in terms of ring, you know, there aren't grants for that, but mm -hmm. there's certainly neighborhood, you know, programs um, and, let people know that. I, I think once people get more comfortable with 
what is available and how it's available that it's uh, you know they may be more willing to try and, and you don't even have to buy ring in order to upload some of the photos if you think they're important so really it's outreach and education Oh, the superintendent is on perception Zoom. is the key yeah if people perceive the fact that they could be watched they're probably reluctant to cause any trouble right and that would be good for the city i think the um superintendent richardson is on zoom if he could be yes thank you i um uh, good evening everyone uh, you're absolutely right council mercia but i will say that um people have been very cooperative with us um i can't get into too much detail but many many of the uh recent investigations we've had is us going door to door and uh, people would provide the videotapes to us and uh, let us see what happened in that neighborhood and uh, it's proved very fruitful for us and I think the manager hit it right on it. Some people just reluctant to sign on to something that you know they wouldn't be able to control in a way. Uh, I think they much rather hear from the officer. I mean it's a lot more legwork for us but th we've definitely been successful and um, we're, we're getting more videos than less videos. I mean people do with businesses and um, uh, homeowners provide that information because they want a safe neighborhood too. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So votes for the city manager, 7-1, vote to accept the 2020 re-precincting plan. Mission to waive the full reading, second reading by title and motion. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, City of Lowell and City Council vote to accept the 2020 re-precincting re plan. Any questions on this? Um, we just got, Madam Manager, we just this was delivered tonight or was it in the packet the re -pre it had previously been in the packet and was referred to um tonight oh yeah 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 okay so there's nothing new there nothing changed it's right. it's the same plan that we had previously presented and discussed with the uh eight districts and the four yeah the solicitor can explain. there were some there are some changes that were put together uh, uh by the state and uh, as noted in the uh, in the cover memo, this was coming to us at uh, uh, sort of the eleventh hour as well. And uh, as explained in the cover memo, the uh, there were changes that um, had to take place. The legislature uh, uh, went ahead with its work of uh, precincting for state rep, state senator, and other uh, state races. And uh, and because of those. They are having a, um, an adverse impact on the local precincting that took place. So uh, with the help of the Secretary of State's office, uh, our map has been adjusted so that uh, the district lines haven't changed, but the, um, uh, these so-called split precincts that they were proposing uh, as a result of this, uh, a couple of them have been, um, uh, have been cured. Uh, this is going to remain a, a work in progress, I think, and, uh, and the implications are going to be far-reaching with a lot of communities. It probably will require additional um, personnel, additional uh, equipment. The uh, Secretary of State's office has already upped their uh, monetary requests for the uh, upcoming uh, year, and, uh, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Okay. Thank you. All right. No questions. Uh, Councilor Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, uh, just a question to the solicitor. How, how many split precincts uh, are there uh, on the, the current map? Um, I mean, originally, we, um, um, our, uh, our precincts pretty much mirrored what we traditionally had. Um, and I think we might have had eight. Uh, there are some communities, like, for example, Haverhill, where uh, they have uh, precincts that have not only been split, but they've, um, they're actually, uh, there are three cuts per precinct. And so uh, again, it's going to potentially necessitate uh, additional ballot machines, additional um, poll workers, uh, additional ballots. Um, so we, um, ours is, is likely 
you know, manageable. I mean, it's going to have to be, but um, um, we're, we're certainly not as hard hit as other communities. And the most important thing is our district lines have not been disturbed. Thank you. It, and uh, sorry, just one follow-up. So it'll be an ongoing process just in, in terms of the next uh, uh, state election next year. The state election. Um, poll uh, polling locations for the sub-precincts. Yep, yeah, manager. yeah. So, so the the districts that were adopted by the council in in the court in the court case, those eight districts, those haven't changed for city council races. What we are talking about is when the legislature did their own districting for the state rep, state senate districts. There were some changes that they did, and so moving forward, we have to be very mindful that of. The, what has already been put in place in respect to that, especially when it comes to the city council race. Um, but the, the um, it, it could be, and, and as the solicitor pointed out, the law department has been working with the Secretary of State's office, that for those state races, for example, there'll be more precincts. So instead of 32 precincts, there may be a few more precincts. And that's where the extra cost comes in because it's not just another location but also equipment and, and people to work those precincts. That's, that's what is being worked on collaboratively with the Secretary of State. All Thank set? You. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, roll call. <coughs> motion. motion to accept by Council Rook, seconded by Council Mercy, a roll call. Mealy. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. Council Noon. Council Rook. Yes. Yes. Council Samaras. Yes. Council Chow. Yes. Council Conway. Yes. Council Drinkwater. Yes. Council Elliot. Seven yes. <coughs> Seven two vote to transfer us to Cemetery Division D <coughs> DPW. Uh, permission to waive the full reading. Second re reading by title and motion. Commonwealth of Massachusetts and City of Lowell and City Council vote to transfer funds from the sale of lots special revenue to the general fund to the per to purchase a loom, a loom to cover in the cemetery <coughs> division DPW. You okay. Um, okay. So I need a motion to adopt by Council Rock, second by Council Samaras. Any questions? Roll call. Bailey. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. Council Noon. Council Rourke. Yes. Council Samaras. Yes. Council Chow. Yes. Council Conway. Yes. Council Drinkwater. Yes. Council Elliott. Seven yes. Last vote of the night. Vote to accept, uh, to apply, accept, and expend a grant, 400,000 PARC grant. Mission away the full reading. Second reading by title and motion. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, City of Lowell, and City Council vote authorizing the city manager to apply, accept, and expend a Parkland Acquisitions and Renovations Communities grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs Division of Conservation Services for the design and construction of phase two of the South Common Master Plan in the City of Lowell. Any questions on that? Motion to adopt by Councilor Drinkwater, second by Councilor Conway. Roll call. Mayor Leahy. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. Council Noom. Council Rourke. Yes. Council Samaras. Yes. Council Chow. Yes. Council Conway. Yes. Council Drinkwater. Yes. Council Elliott. Seven yes. Next report, subcommittee, municipal facilities, subcommittee, December 14th. Uh, Councilor Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Earlier tonight, there was a meeting of the Municipal Facilities Subcommittee um, attending in addition to subcommittee members uh, Rourke and uh, Chow were also uh, Councillor Conway, uh, Councillors Elect uh, Yem and Gitchier, um, as well as City Manager Donahue, DPW Commissioner Christine Clancy, um, Fire Chief Phil Sharon, and the uh, President of Firefighters Local 853, Sean Sorois. Um, the meeting was 
to just get an update uh, and discuss a motion response that the council received uh, back in the, the month of September uh, relative to um, the conditions of fire stations um, and needed repairs. Um, at the time, uh, the, the update was um, that there were approximately $9.3 million in priority repairs that, that needed to happen um, at the fire stations throughout the city. Um, obviously, that uh, would result in years and years of, of capital spending to, to address those issues. But there was also um, about $535,000 in already authorized capital funding um, that could be spent um, uh, immediately uh, or, you know, the goal was to spend it within the, uh, the current fiscal year on uh, some of the, the top priority projects. So um, Commissioner Clancy uh, came to give an update uh, on the process of getting that already authorized capital funding uh, out the door. Um, and currently, um, there is um, a water heating installation project uh, currently underway. Uh, we're awaiting delivery on uh, five of the seven um, water heaters uh, waiting to be installed. Uh, the work will be completed by DPW staff uh, and, and should be um, all the heaters should be delivered um, and work should begin in, uh, in January uh, for that project. Um, another significant project being undertaken with the, the current uh, capital funds is a structural assessment happening at various fire stations throughout the, the city, uh, checking for uh, imminent failures that need to be addressed immediately. Um, that will result um, uh, in, uh, in IFP going out to uh, potential bidders to perform uh, th those projects uh, for the, the highest priority work that's been identified through the, uh, the structural assessment um, that should be um, uh, IFB will go out uh, in, in February or early March and the work would be happening um, hopefully throughout, throughout the spring um, the hope is to complete it during the current fiscal year but some of those projects um, may continue on into FY 23 um, also uh, there's an IFB going out um, on uh, several of the projects to remove hazardous materials uh, to the fire station that will be from uh, various stations that will be going out in January um, with the, the work hopefully beginning later in the winter. Um, there was also uh, uh, bid documents that went out related to the uh, repointing of, of brick at the West, Strick, West 6th Street station. There's actually no responses um, to, to that uh, bid and it'll be uh, going out uh, once again later in, in the winter. Uh, Commissioner Clancy also gave an update that um, sort of separate from this, there's energy audits uh, happening at all of the, uh, the fire stations that may result um, in, in projects, energy saving projects that might be able to uh, capture funding from, uh, from elsewhere and achieve long term cost savings. Um, fire Chief uh, Sharon also spoke just to, uh, to, to give an update. You know, uh, he, he mentioned, which I thought was important, that you know, we're, we're a city where the average age of our fire stations is over 100 years old, 160 years to be precise. Um, and you know, he, he brought up the point that all, this work is, is very important to address the, um, both the working and the living conditions of our city's firefighters. But he also mentioned that um, you know, we're, we're dealing with old buildings where um, you know, we have incredible structural issues and that in the future, um, and I think this is important for this council to consider, um, that we may eventually have to consider the acquisition of land or, or new construction um, to you know, and essentially build new infrastructure to, to address the future needs um, of the, the department and, and our firefighters. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Soroyce, president of Local 853, also came and, and really, and I think this was also very important, really just press, press the council to stay on this uh, in future years, addressing that this is not only gonna take multiple years of um, you know, really making investments through capital funding, but also continued preventative maintenance. Um, and you know, once again, emphasize that these are the, the living conditions uh, of the firefighters and, and his members, and, and really encourage us in future years to keep on this. And um, finally, uh, Manager Don Hughes spoke uh, just to to address really uh, that these are projects that we don't have any any choice but to address. They're, they're priority projects that need to happen, and that the uh, the city is looking into all available funding options, um, including uh, where we can, uh, looking into allowable uses of of ARPA spending, um, and also potentially uh, you know allocations through the the recently passed physical infrastructure bill. Essentially, in, in any and all uh, approach. Um, and, and any potential funding that we could use for this project, um, you know, we, we will look at. So 
Um, really, I think you know it was an important update. It, it was a good meeting, obviously a, a subject that will require continued uh, conversation from this council and the next and the next and so on. Um, because you know the, the the amount of capital spending that'll be needed to get up to speed uh, will take several years of investment. So hopefully a conversation um, that we can we can continue. I think I covered everything, but would welcome uh, any of the subcommittee members to uh, add additional comments if uh, if I missed anything. Chair, any comments? Yeah, that was a great recap. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, just quickly, I think what. Um, Chairman Drinkwater uh, at the time and myself, just looking for the the, um, the 9.36 million dollar breakdown. I know the manager, uh, you already had that, and then also the eligibility uh, for the funds from Opera that can be used towards that 9.36 um, million dollars. And you know, I, obviously, you have a long list of requests for that money, uh, but when you look at it, and you can address this issue once and for all uh, by attributing the Opera money to this. Um, you know, I probably expect a motion to be filed pretty soon on this. So, thank you very much. Sure. Any other comments? All right. I did see them working over at Brant Street today, so I know the guys in DPW are working hard on this stuff. So, thank you. Um, need a motion? Where are we? Uh, motion or accept a report of report of progress by Councilor uh, Drinkwater, seconded by Councilor Rook. Petitions. We have one claim for property damage. We need a motion to refer to the law department for a report and recommendation by Councilor Mercy, a second by Councilor Drinkwater. 9 2 miscellaneous. Catherine Robled requests removal of handicapped parking sign at 39 Cedar Street. We need a motion to refer to a transportation engineer for a report and recommendation by Councilor Samara, seconded by Councilor Rook. And 9 3. Miscellaneous, Sherry Paralavero requests removal of handicapped parking sign at 7280, 72 to 78 Otis Street. Motion referred to the transportation engineer for report and, pro and recommendation by Councilor Chow, seconded by Councilor Conway. 94 National Grid Verizon requests insulation of uh, Joe Pole relocate and two, Joe Pole at Tanner and Plain Streets, uh, Tanner Street realignment. Uh, need a motion to refer a public hearing on January 4th, 2022 at 7 p.m. by Councilor Chow, seconded by Councilor Conway. Motions, uh, City Council motions, 10-1, Councilor Conway. Request City Manager re reach out to the Tunnel of Towers Foundation to explore the feasibility of developing a partnership that will assist to eradicate homelessness for our veterans. Seconded by Councilor Mercia, Councilor Conway. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> you know, week after week, we've, uh, uh, we've all talked about the, uh, the homeless and the problems that uh, they're faced with and, and also the, uh, the issue of, of trying to help them. Uh, in Lowell, and uh, you know, and, and, and let's face it, it it's not just a, a problem in Lowell or an issue in Lowell. It's also an issue in the uh, in the Commonwealth and also a national uh, uh, issue. I think it's also, you know, it's it's pretty easy to identify a problem, and we certainly have identified that problem. I think the real the real test is, what do we do? How do we solve that particular problem? And um, this uh, this organization or foundation called the uh, uh, the Tunnel uh, to Towers, and it was founded by a, uh, a gentleman named Frank Sella, and he was the brother of Stephen Sella, uh, who laid down his life uh, to save others. Uh, he was a firefighter, and on uh, uh, September 11th, he passed away. And the foundation, which was founded by this uh, the brother. Uh, it was also to honor not just the fallen uh, police or fire, but also the military too and first responders. And to make, you know, these individuals that certainly made the supreme sacrifice of life and limb. And for 20 years, uh, this foundation has supported the nation's first responders. And, and I will say, when I did a little bit of research on this, 90%, 93%, I believe, of every dollar goes directly to the uh, uh, individuals in need. 
and, uh, and, and the families too. Now, uh, just recently, it's my understanding that the town of uh, Tatawas uh, announced a uh, ambitious launch uh, for a, um, a national campaign called Operation Home Base. And that particular uh, operation was aimed to eradicate uh, homeless uh, for our, uh, uh, for our uh, veterans. And I think this might be a good idea uh, that perhaps we can contact them. I, we certainly don't have anything to lose. And to see if we can partner up and see if we'll be able to, again, this isn't the magic bullet that's going to take care of the whole problem, but maybe it might take care of a, a small portion of the problem one step at a time. So uh, if, if um, um, I think it would be a, a great idea to reach out and see what their, uh, what their uh, process is and to see if they can help us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions on the motion? Uh, not if you're not registered, sorry. Um, we talk to them right after. All right. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Next motion of the night uh, by Councilor Samaras. Request city manager work with the City of Learning Committee and Congresswoman for hands office to help secure learning city designation from uh, UNESCO. UNESCO, yes. Yeah, seconded by Council Rourke, Council Samaras. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to go back. As mayor, I introduced this program with Dr. John Wooding, a former provost of the University of Lowell. And we went to a group of Lowell businessmen and we were supported in this effort. And that was to ask UNESCO, which is part of the United Nations, to make Lowell a UNESCO learning city. We would be the first city in this country to, re to receive that branding. And, th and the branding's worldwide. Uh, it's, it's amazing that this country has not been involved prior to this. Uh, this project is also supported by the Parker Lecture Series. And we also have been receiving a great deal of support from the city of Cork in Ireland. They are a uh, UNESCO Learning City. They have been very successful with conferences and what have you. We also had the a chance to talk with the Lord Mayor, the City Manager, myself, and Dr. Wooding and others with uh, the Lord Mayor of Cork. And he stated that he would uh, give us all the help that we could possibly receive uh, from UNESCO. And Mr. Mayor, I also brought up the point that I did like the the title Lord Mayor, and I was thinking that maybe this is something we could change in law, but that's another story. The one stumbling block has been that U UNESCO lost its status with the previous president, and we're waiting for President Biden to go back to the original status. We've been in contact with Congresswoman uh, Trahan's office, and she feels that this will be coming down shortly. And once uh, UNESCO is accepted in the United Nations, program, this part of the United Nations program is, is accepted uh, by the President, I feel we're in, uh, we will be able to uh, attain this title. So I'm requesting that the city manager and the next city council and mayor to follow the efforts that uh, have been made and be prepared to work with the advisory council uh, to continue this effort. This would, as I stated, this would brand the city of Lowell as a UNESCO learning city. It's something that has enhanced the quality of life in many other communities that have done this. And it's uh, something that our university, our uh, uh, community college, and others uh, look forward to something like that being part of the Lowell uh, situation. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Last motion of the night uh, by myself, request city manager look into the feasibility of placing handball courts around the city at the appropriate park. Seconded by Councilor Mercia. Um, motion speaks for itself. It just that was brought up by a few people at the YMCA. So if we could take a look at that. Um, any Mr. announcements? Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Sure. Do you have any idea what, what something like that would cost? Are you, are you talking about all over the city? Or what, what? No, that's why I just said just 
if she can just uh, look into the feasibility of seeing where they should be in the appropriate parks. If nobody plays handball in the North Common, then we wouldn't put one there. But if there's a request to put one over in the South Common, uh, where it's close to the Y, then we could explore putting one over there. So I mean, I'm, just I'm check just, it out. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm yeah. not necessarily a bad idea. The only thing is, you know, that we only, <laughs> we only have so many dollars and we've talked here week after week after week talking about, you know, how do we get enough money to pay for this? How do we do, how do we get enough of personnel and so forth? The money's very tight. Uh, and then to go out and do, I don't know, to build handball courts? I, I mean, is, is that a, is that a varsity, varsity sport at Lowell High School? Is that? No, just some, a couple of, um, um, constituents brought it up to me that they're interested in playing handball just like we did with the pickleball courts just kind of look around and see if it's feasible to put a few up in, in the yeah, parks. And, and, and it's funny because I've never seen anybody play pickleball but yeah, you know I think it's probably a good idea to get a report and see what happens on it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other, mo any other announcements? Yes. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'd like to make an announcement. I'd like to make a statement and voice a concern that many people expressed to me over the past few weeks, and I waited to see if there were any more people concerned. That's why I waited until now to say this. This may seem minute to some, but to the calls I received, they meant a lot. We had a football game on Thanksgiving Day, and in the newspaper was no mention of the outcome of which Lowell High School won the game and in, a, and in an extraordinary way as well. But no score was recorded in the newspaper, no write-up for proud parents to clip the coverage out to save for their senior athletes. No one covered the game. How sad was that, that especially for our Lowell High School senior athletes who will never get that chance again. Chemsford and Bill Ricker were written up, Wilmington and Tewksbury was written up and covered but not Lowell. How sad was that to me? And hearing the sadness from the people that called me, someone dropped the ball and it wasn't our Lowell High School athletes. And personally, I feel they deserve an apology. I wish the Lowell Sun person was here because that's how I'm just relaying a message from a heck of a lot of people that were very disappointed. And I can understand that. Being a parent of athletes myself, if they were seniors, they're never going to get that chance again, and I'm sad about it for them. I just thank had you. To a say lot of that. people did bring that up, Madam Manager. Yeah, I just wanted to um, echo the sentiment. I will. I will tell you, it was probably one of the most amazing games. I listened to it on WCAP, and the last minutes were just astounding mm -hmm. uh, you 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 really were it was really breathtaking what was happening and then of course Lowell High did win in in seconds to go but it was a really hard fought battle and it would have been made it would have made a great write-up for the newspaper have, for sure but it wasn't so mm -hmm. I'm disappointed for them mr. mayor thank you yep. I'm, I'm glad yeah, council of mercy you brought that up because I'll tell you that I mean I'm a graduate of Lowell High School and uh, not that I've ever played football, but I will tell you that was one of the that was one of the biggest moments uh, of the year in athletics. And that and that uh, stadium used to be absolutely packed, and it's a shame because they worked very hard day and night for many many weeks to prepare. And that's the big game, and it's a shame that it wasn't put in the newspaper. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, any other announcements, Council Rock? Not just an announcement, but just um, I didn't see on the, on the agenda tonight, 1228 meeting. Are we doing right. something with that? Well, yeah, we're going to bring that up. So, do we want to make a motion to cancel the last meeting on 1228? We usually don't have one in between. So, I know Christmas week is kind of difficult, so I'll, I'll make that motion. Yeah. Motion by Council Rook, second by Council Mercia to cancel the 1228 meeting of the City Council. All those in favor, say it. Oh, roll call. Aye. Roll, uh, roll call. Roll call. Bailey. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. 
Council Newman, Council Rourke, yes. Council Samaras, yes. Council Chow, yes. Council Conway, yes. Council Drinkwater, yes. Council Elliott, seven yeas. Motion adjourned by Council Rourke, second by Council Mercia. Thank you. Eight o'clock, John. Eight o'clock. See, after two years, you finally know how to do this. It was a short agenda. Yeah, I know. I'm with you.